What's up, Nets fans? Welcome to the Brooklyn Buzz, presented by OTGBasketball.com. I'm your host, Nick Fay. With me today, special guest, Brendan Vogt. What's up, Brendan? How's it going, Nick? Thanks for having me on, man. No problem. Happy to get a little Denver perspective on the Nets trade with the Nuggets, kind of get some inside info on Kenneth Harry, Darrell Arthur. Before we get started, just a quick reminder, you can check us out on iTunes, Blog Talk Radio, OTGBasketball.com, and Google Play. But what we'll be talking about today is the trade from about a week ago. Brooklyn uh, received Kenneth Harry, Darrell Arthur, Denver's 2019 first-round pick, protected 1 through 12, and Denver's 2020 second-round pick, unprotected. And Denver received Isaiah Whitehead, who I believe they waived. Initial thoughts on the trade when you saw it? Yeah, so it's a big win for Tim Connolly in so far as I can tell you there was definitely pressure from the top for uh, to get out of the luxury tax. And that was always going to be a difficult maneuver. Denver had to try to extend Jokic, re-sign Bar- Barton, those are expensive, uh, expensive moves. And they had to try to find a way to get off of some dead money without giving up valuable assets. That's a really tough spot to be in. Uh, to be fair, Nick, they put themselves in that position <laughs> by signing free to that deal, by signing Plumley to his deal. But their backs were against the wall. And I think to to be able to move Chandler in that Philly trade and, and get off Arthur and Fareed in this deal with the most valuable asset being a protected first. I think all said and done, that's a win for Denver. I don't know how you guys felt in Brooklyn, but it it seemed like a pretty on-brand move for Sean Marks at this point. Yeah, it felt like a win-win for both sides. Like you said, everybody kind of knew Denver wanted to get under that luxury tax. And the Nets, they don't mind taking on a bad contract, especially an expiring one where they can keep cap space for next year. Add another first-round pick. The Nets actually have their first-round pick for next year, which feels like the first time in a million years. (laughs) But uh, it's it's nice to have more than one pick. You know, they actually, quote-unquote, might have trade assets, which is a weird thing to say for the Nets, where it feels like they lost them all to Boston. But... You know, I think for both sides, it kind of worked out. The only, t- you know, the Atlanta deal was kind of correlated to this one too. And that's like the only team that seemed to really get the bad end of the stick. So I think uh, Denver and Brooklyn both kind of came out pretty okay from this one. But um, I agree. Oh, Sorry. go ahead. I was just going to say, I agree. And, and frankly, talking to some of my friends back home who are Nets fans, this deal sort of felt like a matter of time. I really think yep. the only hang up was the protection on that first first rounder. Um, but I, but we knew that, but, Brooklyn was a prime candidate to absorb uh, this type of money for that type of asset. So it seemed inevitable to me, man. Yeah. And for Reed, honestly, you know, he kind of fits some of the needs the Nets have in terms of like toughness and rebounding. You know, it's still unknown how many minutes he'll play and whatnot. But tell us a little bit about what Kenneth Fareed can bring to a team. Sure. So the funny thing about Kenneth Fareed is he was buried at the end of the Den- uh, Denver's bench, right? And he was out of the out of the rotation inside of Malone's doghouse, but he still does have something he can offer to an NBA team. In terms of players who can come in and bring a lot of energy on the boards, the offensive glass, produce a highlight player too, Farid is still perfectly capable of sparking a 10-2, to two, a 9 nothing run on his own. He's that type of energy player. The problem is, Nick, in, in the modern NBA, he hasn't really evolved his game. He's not. He can't shoot from 12 feet, let alone 20 And he's not a great playmaker, not a very skilled player, and his on-ball defense struggles. So if you look at the way the power forward position has changed in this league, he no longer fits the bill the way he did even just like, you know, five years ago. The league has changed so much. That said, you know, for Denver, it was just a guy who was sort of given up on that situation and was being paid way too much money to do a very specific role. So that's why his value sort of tanked, and that's why people got down on him collectively. But in a new situation, Nick, he can still help a team. And I think a team like Brooklyn could benefit from his energy if, if he's committed, if he's willing and able to play his, uh, his best basketball in Brooklyn. Would you say a fair comparison for him would be like a more supercharged like Reggie Evans, you know, the rebounding monster? Yeah, absolutely. The one thing I would say about Fareed, though, is, is I just worry sometimes if that energy is selective. I mean, yeah. he'll put it on, he'll put his foot on the pedal when, you know, there's a highlight play looming, you know, when he first gets in the game yep. and he gets his chance. But it, it it often seems like more like he's interested in looking flashy than he is actually playing that gritty game. Because um, it's, it's really more of how well he plays in transition. But in the half court on either end, he's a little limited. Gotcha. What do you think would be an underrated aspect of his game? Just something that Nuggets fans would see and maybe not the general NBA. Yeah, so... He doesn't space the floor the way you'd like your modern power forward to because he can't shoot at all. But he actually does a very, very good job in that dunker spot. And I don't mean on the receiving end of an alley-oop in transition. I mean, he knows sort of how to how to disappear in the floor, how to hang out in the dunker spot towards the baseline without sort of cramping the spacing of your center or your guards. So 
even though he doesn't really shoot, he knows how to sort of operate in the half court. Um, he mitigates his limitations and he, he doesn't necessarily cramp spacing as much as other limited forwards do. He, he is a smarter offensive player uh, than I gave him credit for in, the, in these last few minutes. He's a more capable one. It's, it's just like there are little things he could have done to keep himself on the floor more and longer, it seems. And he hasn't quite added those aspects to his game. Yeah, do, doing the really, dirty work. Exactly, exactly. Or even, man, just developing a 12-foot jump. I know, like, it's really easy to say this guy just needs to learn how to shoot, and some guys simply can't. But I never got the impression that Farid was doing everything he could to learn how to shoot from 12 feet. So, gotcha. you know, there, some of it's his fault. But, but he can still fit into, like... He doesn't need to be a shooter to space the floor alongside a traditional center. So he's he is underrated in that aspect. Would you say, based off of what you told me and then the feel around the Nets has been, you think he'll be better off as kind of like a small five than playing at the four at all? Yeah, sure. Especially because I think you really want to use Farid in spurts. I don't think he's like a 20-plus minute a game guy. But I do think he's good to spark a run here or there. So you're looking to go smaller. Um you know, for a few minutes and, and try to run and run the other team off the floor. He's a great option there for sure. But yeah, like in a traditional, like if he was a starting power forward, I think he would struggle with some of those matchups defensively for sure. So yeah, I see where you're coming from with that. What do you think would be his number one problem? Obviously you mentioned the shooting being an issue and then the lack of defense and doing the dirty work. Well, if you had to say one thing, it'd be his biggest flaw. I think it's the defense. I think it's really easy to look at the highlight blocks and the high flying stuff because that's what shows up on on the YouTube clips, obviously. But if you watch him 82 games a season, it's it's limited. It's a little lazy, frankly. And so he's such a big athletic body, and you'd love the idea of tossing him out there in a modern playoff series, switch everything, play physical. But he just doesn't really play that well. He's a little deceiving because his physicality is so impressive. I. You know, it's always it was it was always disappointing to me to watch him play defense. Yeah, that definitely is not encouraging. <laughs> but um, do you expect him to bounce back in Brooklyn? Do you think he'll have a breakout year? Not necessarily a breakout year, but just kind of get more into the minutes. You know, have some nice contributions to the team. Or Nets yeah. fans shouldn't really expect a lot from him. Well, let's be clear, and I think you agree with me on this. The trade was about picking up that first rounder, right? These guys are yep. expiring. They're not a part of Brooklyn's future. But no, for as much as I've sort of knocked him, I, I want to be clear. I do think Fareed still has something to offer. And I just don't think it was ever going to happen in Denver. I think there were two parties there had a mutual understanding that they would move on from each other as soon as possible. If he's in a position where he feels valued, he might feel reinvigorated. And he is absolutely still a useful basketball player. It's just it's just a question of how useful. For the Nuggets, $12 million a year useful, pushing you into the luxury tax useful? No. For Brooklyn and where they're at, absolutely, man. I think he can help next season. Yeah, it's definitely going to be interesting. Obviously, the Nets had a lot of success getting Damari Carroll in the salary dump. I don't expect that to happen, but I do, like you said, kind of expect him maybe to kind of give us some nice minutes off the bench, bring that energy, hopefully throw down some nice dunks, get the crowd excited at Barclays Center. But moving to the other side of the trade, Darrell Arthur, who there's still some question of the Nets are going to keep him and possibly waive him. It could be a real possibility, but what does he bring to the table? I know he shoots around 41% from three. Yeah, at this point, man, he is really more of a locker room presence guy. He was not catching a lot of minutes in Denver. That could be different in Brooklyn. Um, he, he spaces the floor a little more than some bigger guys. He's more well-suited to transition into this era than Fareed, for sure. But his his role as a, as a real contributor on the floor, I think that's behind him. Those days are behind him. And I can tell you this. He's probably the most sorely missed individual in that Nuggets locker room um, after all these salary dumps. He, he played a big role in, in just sort of keeping that group together. I, I think he's just a fun hang. I think guys just yeah. respect him and enjoy his conversation. And that, that sounds, uh, I don't mean to downplay that at all. Like, I think that's very valuable in the modern NBA. So especially for a team like the Nets. Yeah, you see it a lot. I mean, I saw on Twitter a lot of Nuggets fans. I know a lot of the writers pointed out that he did. He had like a big speech, I want to say, at some point in the season last year for the Nuggets as well. I think that's really encouraging, even if he doesn't seem on court play. You know, they also picked up Ed Davis, who is known to be a big locker room guy, too. So, I mean, I think the locker room in the NBA is kind of an underrated aspect that people don't really think of think about. But then you look at a team like the Wizards, where that could kind of ruin their season. You Absolutely. want to make sure your locker room's on point. Absolutely. And I think Darrell Arthur is. If he's not an A locker room guy, he's a B plus locker room guy. So it's, it's a, you know, ha just having him around, even if he doesn't play, I do think can help for sure. And this is just an obviously a super early prediction question, but 
where do you think the Nuggets traffic will land? Obviously, you guys just picked up IT, and a lot of the young guys are going to get better. I know the Nuggets are personally one of my league pass watch teams, but where do you think the draft pick's going to land, if you had to make a guess? Yeah, the, the last two years, they were in 13-14, uh, and I think a lot of that was, like, there were some missed opportunities. The Nuggets were three games out of the three seed last year. They missed 44 games from Paul Millsap, six from Jokic, six from Harris. So a healthy Nuggets team, uh, actually could have flirted with home court last year. I firmly believe that. I think they'll be better. I think they'll be healthy this year, Nick. So my early prediction would be 18, 17, 18, 19, somewhere in that range. I do expect this pick to convey in the first year. I, I highly doubt Denver ends up in the top, in the bottom 12 drafting. Yeah, I think 18 is fair. I wouldn't even be surprised if it was a little bit closer to 20. I mean, like I said, I was a big fan of the Nuggets last year. They kind of made me look bad. But also Millsap going down, I was really excited about that signing. And then the fact he got injured, I felt like that really hurt. And then you could tell me if I'm wrong, but when he came back, it felt like he really never got into the groove either. You know, it seemed that way at first, and there were a lot of stylistic concerns, and those were real. But if you if you look at the, between the beginning of the season and, and the final few weeks, the Nuggets with with Millsap in, in there, their starting lineup was one of the better starting lineups in the league. It's still a smaller sample size. I do think they sort of, uh, they did a good job, I think, of moving past those sort of stylistic concerns. Millsap, it looked like Millsap was the one who was demanding a lot of ISO touches. I think a lot of it simply was Nikola Jokic being too deferential. He's a very, very passive guy. His mm -hmm. ego is as small as it gets for a max player in the league. So, there was a learning curve there where they needed young Jokic to realize you're actually the best player on the team and it's okay if the ball's in your hands. I do think they got to that place. So I would expect a full season of Millsap in there with Will Barton starting at the three. I think you're going to be looking at, at worst, one of the five best half court offenses in the league, if not top three, man. Yeah, just looking at the roster, it just looks like a lot of fun to watch. Just a ton of offense out there. And then, like we talked about a little bit off the show, IIT coming in could possibly bring a nice spark, too. We, yeah. we kind of ask this to everybody who is on the show that's not a Nets fan. What do you look at the Nets? You know, what do you think will happen this year? Will they be around the eight seed, closer to the lottery, one of the worst teams? What are your thoughts on this Nets squad? Yeah, it's hard to tell now, right? That just <laughs> seems wide open. I yeah. think the Nets could sneak into the playoffs at this point. Um, depending on what happens with Kevin Love, like I'm not sure Cleveland's better than the Nets are in, in a yeah. best case scenario season for Brooklyn. I, you know, when I look at Brooklyn, man, for me, it's less of, okay, where will they finish this upcoming year? And it's more of, I have nothing but appreciation for the job this new regime is doing. The way they have stocked their cupboard full of assets after that horrific Boston trade that you mentioned, there was no path to gaining assets. There was no path to organically building a team back to some level of competence. And yet they seem to have found one, to have manifested one out of thin air. And it's with deals like this one, this, this Fareed and Arthur deal, their willingness to recognize their cap space isn't as valuable as capturing those middle of the road assets, those first round picks. So I don't know where the, Nugget, where the Nets will land this year. I do know that they're on the right track. And I actually look at them in the last two to three years as one of the better run organizations in the league, believe it or not. Yeah, they went from probably being one of the worst run organizations to one of the better run ones. Shout out to Sean Marks. And like you said, that whole front office doing a lot of work. Honestly, I could have never expected when he took over, he'd do this all in three years. I thought it would be even a longer process. Now we're looking at cap space possibly next year to sign a big fish. You know, it's pretty exciting for Brooklyn, but big shout out to Brendan for hopping on. Obviously, check him out on Denver Stiffs. Does a lot of great writing for them. And as always, thank everybody for listening. You can check us out on iTunes, Blog Talk Radio, OTGBasketball.com, and Dash Radio.